from the Pathway Studios in Johnston proper. You are live from the Path. And you're listening to live from the path coming from the Pathway Studios here in Johnston proper. Yeah. I was just coming in hot. Yeah, yeah. No, you do that. Uh, okay. Let's stop Fantastic. that. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I thought it wasn't good. So here's what we've got going on the show tonight. Uh, Boof is in town. Hey. I, I, I think it's a, some sort of court summons or something. Yeah, like he had you know to, I always get in trouble. He uh, requests to appear or whatever. <laughs> Uh, so Boof is in town for tonight. Uh, you're welcome, maybe. Uh, and then Dan, listen here. I'm gonna tell you something about Dan Hudson. Oh no! <laughs> when you when you when you see him on the show and you watch him, you think that guy. He's hot. He's been yeah. Oh. Like one, he's burning up the pixels, and two, like you would think that he's a man harvesting show content all week. You're like it's just it's pouring out of him. Yeah. Ah, he vomits it like a sickness. Oh, yes. He just can't. It's it's he's got content poisoning. Now, well, you will be surprised to find out that, that uh, Dan is more of a kind of wait and see what the room shakes out as. <laughs> uh, and then and then tread lightly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe jump in, maybe not. There's some prudence in it. <laughs> uh, but Dan was on fire this week. He got a number of articles I saw come across the old, uh, the old Facebook from Dan Hudson. So we're going to – now, Dan, did you have – do you have a favorite in here? I, I, I have to be honest. I have to look at what I sent. Okay. I was going to say, he's going to have to remember all the things he sent <laughs> right. this week. You know that. All I do is read stuff all day long, and sometimes I think, oh, I should send this on. And Okay, Boo, I'm going to give you guest, guest choice here. you got warning signs of a cult, masters of church, or pastors are glad they're quitting ministry. Oh, cult for sure. Cult. Okay, let's go, for, let's go with the cult. Yeah, I thought that was good. Then you can do a view of, hey, man, have I been in one of these? And I just have, I just don't know about it yet. Yeah, maybe but, I maybe I I don't agree with it. What do you mean you don't agree with it? Maybe I maybe the thing they say is cult behavior is not cult behavior. Oh well, okay, okay let's try it. Here we go. Uh, what's that? Yeah, where's this go. from? Belief net. Dan, the open. <laughs> the, hey, you didn't even check the belief. source. The, o- the opening of this is weird. Colts may appear may appear wonderful on the outside. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> I feel Everybody's like I don't friendly. know who's at fault here. If it was Dan for sending it, or if it was me for picking it, uh, <laughs> playing little finger symbols, it's great, <laughs> man. I mean, I feel like we're really being set up. Well, you know, Colts may be wonderful. <laughs> I often think of Colts spoken in a very positive light. <laughs> That's not a negative word at all. I've been trying a Colt. It's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, something has to be attractive. You're like going to drink Kool Aid and then go wait for the Haley Bop or whatever. I mean, you know, it's, I may have just mix it up. get everybody. Together, but uh, <laughs> something's attractive about him. Kool Aid uh, Kool Aid uh, has been more uh, appealing to people than Jesus for at least 50 years. That's about <laughs> the like, I mean, I, you got a fruit punch bowl that breaks your house down going, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Colts may appear wonderful on the outside, but on the inside are, <laughs> they may not. are very manipulating. <laughs> Cult leaders are desperate to trick you into joining. They are after your obedience, your time, and your money. Cults use sophisticated mind control and recruitment techniques like a Jedi that have been refined over time. Many people think that they can't be deceived by a cult, but that's far from the case. Mike? Hmm. Now, you, now, now the, the reason he opens that way is he's, he's setting it up like this could be your church. I mean, because like, you're thinking it's wonderful. I love this place. It's oh, very friendly. Right, right. They're not you saying never, you, you know that, think it was that you. death cult sounds okay. appealing. I mean, he, he's trying to get <laughs> Valid you. Point, yeah. You know, okay, okay, yeah, okay. You got to shake him up the a author bit. here. All right, uh, beware of thinking that you are immune from cult involvement. Cult, <laughs> Boover, you want a cult? No, I'm immune. No, I'm immune. <laughs> yeah. I got yeah. the shot. I've been approached. <laughs> I've been I approached a thousand times, and like I just uh, I fend it off. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in for a booster on that one. <laughs> Colts have millions of members around the world who once thought they were immune and still don't know they're even in a cult. Because oh, get to it, flabberjabber. To spot a cult, you need to know how they work, and you need to understand the techniques they use. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is a guy who puts on a weekend se- seminar <laughs> yeah. in 50 cities, uh, 50 cities a year, of which nine people attend. <laughs> <laughs> who are probably obviously in a cult already. Okay, <laughs> how to avoid sophisticated mind control 101. <laughs> just give me your tax papers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you everything you need to know. Uh, okay. Once you understand how cults work, you will be better able to identify them, avoid recruiter, and protect family and friends. Here are five warning signs of a cult masked as a church. Number one, God. the pastor slash leader is always right. See, now, if this is the quality, I do feel like 
There are probably some. In fact, uh, some of the most egregious um, videos that have gone around. You remember that guy who called everybody out from the pulpit? He had a big old had a big old pulpit, and he was like, "I'm doing this because I love you, but you sleeping with that girl or something." Like <laughs> <laughs> turn the sound down. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That guy. That, and he was yelling at the guy's mom, like, "Don't you you let me chastise this boy because I love him." Anyway, this guy seems like a real wingding who, like, he's always right. Yeah, he's, he don't fail. So it says, if the pastor leader is always making himself or herself right, this may be a sign of cult involvement. There is no tolerance for questions or critical inquiry. If you disagree with church leadership, then you are told is your issue because you have to learn to submit to imperfect authority. Well, yeah. I mean, I appreciate that it's just said as like a sign of this because I think that might just be a lot of. The problem is, general, is that people people who generally don't want to change their life will will act the same way as, they, and they'll be like, these guys think they're always right, and they're always trying to tell me what to do, and like, and, and it's spiritual abuse and. It's probably a solid 50-50 <laughs> yeah. where the guy just literally does not want to change anything, wants to continue acting in a horrible way, and then just have people go, yeah, that's cool. Keep rocking. You know, like the same guy will accuse leadership of being, you know, uh, over commanding or insisting they're always right. But like if you're insisting that Jesus is always right, right. and I agree with him as a person, then Jesus is right, right. and you're wrong, friend. You know, yeah, and so like – I'm not saying that, that, that there's plenty of spiritual um, authority abuse that has gone around, but it is, it is a pretty broad brush. Yeah. You know, just to say that leadership, if, if you disagree with leadership and they say, look, we have to stick to our principles on this thing, if they come from the Bible, then they should insist that we are going to stick on our principles on this thing. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see how this case builds with the rest of the four signs there, because I think that's just a, a common thing that happens all the time, regardless of cult or not. Okay. So far, I'm not sold. <laughs> but it might, it might contribute. But it's possible. <laughs> yeah, 20% in. We'll see. As soon as the tambourines show up, <laughs> I'm totally moving over to the cult is, camp. Does that guy have 14 bracelets and a handpan? I think I'm out of here. <laughs> he sewed a tambourine <laughs> in his jeans leg. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> Uh, that was the th- that was after uh, Matthias, the next apostle appointed, was Bo Jangles. <laughs> <laughs> says whenever you bring up a legitimate biblical issue to leadership, they find a way to turn it around on you and point out that you are not only wounded. Dog. Okay, so here's I'm gonna tell you this up front. Uh, uh, this this is the same type of conversation that you're gonna hear from um, a good portion of house churches and um, people who feel like they just got burned at the church, mm. and, right? But. Half, at least, of those two crowds who are taking a whiz off the back deck onto the church are people who severely needed to listen to what people were saying. <laughs> and so when they said, you know, I really got a problem. I don't think we should allow uh, Tristan and his wife in here because I heard that they were intimate before they got married. And you're like, no, you're wrong about this. The Lord is good. They've, they're have they repenting and moving on with a good, wonderful life. And I really don't think they should. And like – and so they left because the pastor's not biblical, and their complaint wasn't heard. Their complaint wasn't heard because they were wrong. Yeah. And they refused right. to actually submit to their wrongness. And then they went and started their own organization that could – they, they actually are becoming this. You know the critique is misplaced when the thing that you are upset about somewhere else, you created in your own backyard to, f- to fix the problem. You, you didn't – you wanted someone to be right. You just wanted that to be you. Yeah, you weren't burned by the church or by God or anything like that. You just couldn't handle a, a spotlight being put back on you and, and your crap and taking any kind of criticism. That wasn't the yeah. Thing. You were the problem, not it. So, so I guess like I'm, I'm the, the problem is this can be. It's like every every dear life from the path. You know that you're there's another side of the of the right. equation that you're not getting where you're like I'm mistrustful that I'm getting a full story. And so I, I would say I, I'm agree. I will agree that this happens for one and t- but two. I'd have to hear it from. Like your best, your best Jesus loving buddy to tell me right. that this is also someone who loves you enough to tell you that you're off your rocker. Yep. Uh, before I would totally buy into some of that. All right, number two, deception. Mm-hmm. A cult needs to recruit and operate using deception. Why? Because if people knew their true practices and beliefs beforehand, then they would not join. I'm looking at you, Sam's Club. A cult <laughs> needs to hide the truth from you until they think you are ready to accept it. What is the truth, though? Hey. So think about this, though. A cult needs to hide the truth from you until they think you are ready to accept it. Now, I will be honest. I am particularly sensitive to this in modern church contexts where it doesn't feel like we know exactly when to transition people from milk to milk to meat. 
Uh-huh. Like mm-hmm. if if you're if you're um, hey they're guests we want to make them comfortable right. I, I'm on that uh, and we want but but you want them they're seeking Jesus so they need to meet Jesus in the thing that they're seeking mm-hmm. right and so I think there is a, a well intentioned line that is difficult to try to try to make sure you don't put them off with the celebration yep. of Zeus they don't know. Um, but that you're not trying to trick them. Like, well, they've been here a year. Now we can tell them, by the way, you have to give up all these things. There, I mean, there's a – can you imagine if the woman at the well, like she ran into Jesus, right? But instead of the interaction that he had with her, he said, here, have a cup of coffee and sit down. You're loved. And then that was it, right? That's where we left it. Yeah. There is There is a thing where, like, for people to meet Jesus, they actually have to be introduced – to, to Jesus, you know, and like I get the milk part, and I and I get like I, I can't imagine that you want to open up on on whatever the festival of booze, you know, and really beat them up on it, you know, and, or you know, but but honestly, we do tiptoe around letting them meet Jesus and letting be let them be offended if they're going to be offended, let them let them take it in harshly if they're going to take it. In. Jesus did, did not like, obviously he has the wherewithal as the Son of God and whatnot to, to be able to. Like, have a pointed conversation with somebody and reveal truths to them yeah. that are very specific to them that you may not have, you know. But we do I, – I have seen this with a couple of very um, well-intentioned people who I think love people, and their whole goal is to just be around others and, and to just love them like Jesus would love them. But, like, if you watched how Jesus loved people, he really – I mean, he really hit him with true things. Right, he didn't pull punches. Right, like like a good friend of his, Peter, he called him Satan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they'd been friends for a while, <laughs> you know. And like, seen him do some good stuff. Too. <laughs> you know, like at the Sons of Thunder, he'd made fun of. I mean, he was on it, and so like it. It just seems like uh, you know, if if you're gonna take the the love of Jesus is intentional and always truthful, and so sometimes like. There is a such thing as omitting the truth until you feel like the time is right. Um, I don't know. I'd be really checking in with, with, with Jesus about that stuff, like on how much you're going to withhold back for what reason. You know, like yeah. if you're talking about uh, non or traditional Jewish laws versus the Pentateuch, maybe we can hold off on getting in the weeds on that thing, right? But if we're talking about the things that Jesus talked about, I, you should probably have right at it. I, I don't. I don't know that that's what this article is talking about, though. No, I, mean, I don't think so. But it jumped out at me. It's like it, with yeah. what you're withholding. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's more like, well, when you get to a certain level, you shave your head and wear a, a, a robe. <laughs> you know, it's like we're not going to tell you that the first week. Uh, we're going to wait till you get to level four. Yeah. Now you that you're at a topaz level member, you, <laughs> right, right. You, we expect ten thousand dollars yearly, and then what you mean, also an apostle have to give us and... your second born. <laughs> we're it, not first borners. We need second born. Yeah. But in the end, isn't that actually less dramatic than the fact that, like, hey, we surprise you and say, by the way, Jesus wants to be Lord over your whole life. You know what I'm saying? Like the hair shaving thing. If someone pr- put that on you, you'd be like, boy, that's kind of radical. But like, I like my hair. There's just a caution that we withhold this notion of Jesus as Lord until someone's yeah. Like ready, and so like I know it is yeah. right. I know that's what 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 it, this wasn't getting at, but like I, I almost it, it makes you think about right what, how you couch information. What are you withholding so that people don't think that you're weird? Mm. Man, that's a valid point. Like I always, I've I've never hit that like that though because I feel like in my in, in any situation I find myself in, I I err on the side of being soft in, in the beginning and like. Pulling punches and like if I meet you and and you know sin A sin B sin C right it doesn't really matter what it is but like I'll go oh I'm not going to bring them into to the sin conversation because Jesus loves them and why would they care about what their sin is until they know that that sure. you know this kind of stuff right yep but it also does make sense your point like Jesus didn't pull those punches like he he hit that where it needed to be and. And followed it up with love immediate. So I think that's that's the right distinction. And we talked about this, I want to say, four or five shows back when, like, what does it look like to actually – how do I evangelize? And, like, part of the deal was, like, you shouldn't have to be pulling punches because you shouldn't be going around throwing punches. That's uh, fair, yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, the, the notion is more like, what did I – with? it's more about what did I withhold. Right. And so, like, if it was the right time to do it, did I back away? Now, there's all kinds of times when this isn't the right time to do it. Um, just like, hey, do I expect you to wear your Jesus T-shirt and your end is near placard walking around your church building or your office building? No, because you wouldn't normally do that. But like, if I would normally 
tell someone, boy, that's rough. Let me, I'm going to pray on that. Yeah. I'm going to do it at work. Right. Like, I'm not going to be genuine. I'm not going to pull. Yeah, that's right. There's a, there's a genuineness to it. And so I think there's a genuineness to a Sunday morning. There's a genuineness to anything that your church is doing to say, look, I'm not going to not be me in my relationship with Jesus in any given situation. But me being genuine in my walk with Jesus also doesn't mean that I just name drop Jesus at every opportunity because that's not. Right. That's not normal. Ned Flanders is the weird way to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, a cult will also have a slick, well-rehearsed public relations front, which hides what the group is really like. Yeah. The mission of the cult may look similar to a church. You will hear how they help the poor, support each other in community, emphasize peace, or save the environment. They will tell you how happy you will be in their group. Everyone in the cult always appears to be happy and enthusiastic, mainly because they've been told to act happy, and will get in trouble if they don't. So the city of Portland, Oregon, is a cult? Yeah. Actually, I'm agree with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's happy, helps the poor, they recycle. Dogs have the same level of uh, any citizenship as everyone else walking around. Mike, what's the what's the, what's what's the if you had to give Portland a vibe like by color, like what would it be? Sounds like a terrible on, question on a, on like a rainbow scale. Turquoise. Tur- it's very turquoise. turquoisey in Portland. Yeah, Is turquoise on the rainbow. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Roy G. No, there's no T in there. <laughs> I was say, you're pre- you're pretty yeah. Roy G. Biffed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, third, exclusivism. A normal religious organization would not have any trouble with you moving to another similar organization as long as you stayed in that same religion because it's the belief system that matters, not membership in an organization. For example, if you're a Christian, then you could move from a church to another and still be Christian. Now, yeah, I, that's a little shallow to me uh, because, one, it discounts the fact that you have relationships with these people. Right, exactly. You do care that they went somewhere else. There's also like sometimes it personally hurts because it feels like it's a judgment upon you in some way or another for right. someone to go somewhere else. It's also what I, I think it's a loving question to go where are you going and why, yeah. right? Like if 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 you know someone who is is uh, proclaimed to follow Jesus and they they're church hopping every two years trying to find a place that is more toward their liking, they might be missing the whole point of the Jesus is Lord thing and more like I am Lord. Suit suit these Sunday services to my taste, you know. And so, like, out of loving kindness, you go, "What is it that you're that you're looking right. for?" You know. Yeah. I mean, if you gotta go, you gotta go. I totally get it. But like, uh, you've you've been to three churches in six years. What is it that you're after? You know, if you can, and maybe you won't find it here, whatever it is. But um, I, you should be able to tell somebody, say, "Look, God's got me going here. I don't know why He did, and so we're moving." And that's cool. That's a completely understandable reason. But if you're like, well. I like the worship at this other place or something, or they have they have coffee and donuts, and I'm tired of having to work the nursery. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. maybe it's, you should try to try to organize and fix the place that you're at before you're ready to kick the tires and leave. Yeah, it's less possession, and it's more just loving relationship. There, it's like, hey, I just I care about you. We've gotten to know each other over the last six months or whatever. Where are you going? Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think not. That's hey, fine. you can't leave here. And that's not like that's I, different. And that's not churches going, hey, I want to own you, or I want you right. to be part of our cult, or like we need your numbers here. You know, sometimes it legit is just people going, look, I care about you. And, like, you have some actual things to do that Jesus has put you in charge of, and you seem to be bailing on it to be entertained better. Yeah. You know, for, with a fog machine. <laughs> yeah. We, we care about why you're leaving. You're leaving because you've been here for two weeks and aren't an elder yet. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. You want some more authority. Maybe right. these guys are we, just giving it out. We didn't make you head of nursery because one time you saved a baby from, like, grabbing a toy. <laughs> right. we got to have that guy back into children's ministry. <laughs> you're in charge of everything. Great job. You're a deacon. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see here. So, blah, 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 blah. For example, okay, we already talked about that. It's not the belief system that decides your future, but it's the belief system in your membership with that particular group. The cult leaders will make you believe there's nowhere else that you can go and still be saved. And if you ever leave the one true church, then you're going to hell. This is a fear-based control mechanism designed to keep you in the cult. Do, have, you, have you ever seen churches that act this way? I mean, are, are these valid critiques? Are there churches yeah. out oh, here yeah. doing this thing? Oh, yeah. It says, yeah, yeah. It's happening, definitely. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, next, cult, cult, uh, fear and intimidation. Cult leadership is feared. To disagree with leadership is the same as disagreeing with God. The cult leaders will claim to have direct authority from God to control almost all aspects of your life. If the cult is not a religious group, then questioning the leaders or program will still be seen as a, as a sing of rebellion and stupidity. Guilt is a tactic they will use to control you. This is hard. This is hard because you'll find some dudes or ladies... And like they will, 
Like they seem to have a spiritual authority, you know, like mm-hmm. or God has right. told them something, you know, and, and, and you've seen it and you're like, okay. And, and you get worried about your own relationship with Christ and your own understanding of the scriptures. And you're like, well, the Holy Spirit isn't like tapping on my shoulder telling me things. So maybe God's talking to me through this person. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I mean, it, in the wrong hands, you know, they can right. s- totally use that for their own glory or power and not be using it for the service of Christ. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. The the the, the authority within the, the church body that you're a part of, like that, that does exist. But it is absolutely able to be abused and many times in all over the world is and so that's it's dangerous and it's very viable that it's a problem but so what's a what's a way to combat against that fellas right like if, if you feel like you're in a situation like that what's well, a good in, biblical way to you, you feel like you're in a cult no when you feel like 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 maybe you're under some spiritual authority that might be taking advantage of you or yeah, using you got it for a leader their own in your gains. church that that it's no longer a, a god given authority that they've got through that it's they're abusing it i don't know what's what's a good way to double check that action well, ho- hopefully you have uh some solid christian friends that you can bounce off of and say right. hey, just check me on this you know am i being overly sensitive or is this uh what, what do you what do you see in this i think that'd be a legitimate conversation yeah hopefully ones that don't go to that church who can look at it? Right, like just yeah. taking the That's information as it, as it stands, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, there's obviously prayer in it too, like yeah, honest, like bare bones prayer to it, and figuring yeah. out through there, like, hey, you know, God, if you want to reveal to us that this is something that we are subject to in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you, and this is something that's real, you know, make that known. If it's something that's not, same situation. If this is authority that you have not given. This is authority that is being abused, and we are under. Make it known. Yeah. Okay. You're going to push back, but you're going to do it. Hum- you're going to seek in humility. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and, and again, I think this is where you got to be careful. Somewhat to the example we were talking about earlier, which is like, you know, you, you run the risk of just disagreeing with someone in some level of right. Uh, I don't even like love the word authority. To be honest with you, like someone who's got the responsibility for your leadership. Uh, and responsibility for a group of folks, yeah. um, and so you know they you should be able to talk to them, and they should also react humbly. Um, but you know people often do push back simply because they don't like to hear the fact that they're making choices that are outside of right. yeah. biblically what what would Still be directed. Involved. Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a young guy who's been attending our, our church, and um, uh, coming from a background where that's a very controlling situation. Um, where the pastor like I mean controls like a lot uh, of their lives, and he, to the point he's like, okay, I don't know that this is healthy, and then that it's good, and and um, trying to figure out scripturally what to do and everything. So he'd been coming for here for a while, but then I hadn't seen him for a few weeks, and, and I thought well, I better check up on him and make sure he's not like been sucked into you know intimidation right. type yep. thing. Are they are yeah. they after him? I said he didn't have to come to this church, but. I want to make sure he's okay, yeah, you, of you know, spiritually. So I checked with him. He goes, "Oh yeah, 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 I'm good." You know, I'm going to my cousin's, you know, church too. And you know, I was praying about them. You know, I like pathway. I said, "Well, I'm not here to, you know, try to sell pathway. I just want to make sure you're all right." You know, yeah. And uh, because there are there are can there can be intimidating, right? Uh, Fear mongering, mongering, mongering. Is that the word? Uh, yeah. People that that will you know threaten your salvation, threaten your spiritual health, threaten all you know all kinds of threats that you if you give them too much position of authority in your life you you, you might believe them that they right. they they can do things that they really can't uh, so yeah i mean i've seen that i've run a, run a, I've run a, 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 right. a across that before uh, for sure yeah and, and maybe as a maybe as a, a feedback on well here let's finish the last one there's uh no accountability for leadership this happens when right. leaders only allows I feel like this is written by a guy whose who's English is not the first language. Uh, only allows those they know agree with them into leadership positions. It is biblical for a church to have elders in place, but they need to be mature elders, not puppets of the pastors. The elders are the butter buffer between the shepherd <laughs> and the sheep. In fact, elders are the basis for the New Testament church, and as Paul planted churches, he appointed elders in every church. The Bible tells us Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord. It's imperative that your church has checks and balances. If your church leaders refuse to allow a mature elder board or council to be put in place, your church might be a cult. Ran into this um, through my my in-laws, uh, actually, recently. It was not a situation where they were appointing like mature elders and stuff like that, but there was 
a, a connection a network of churches where it was um, like insane nepotism from the perspective of like it would be one guy was kind of the top mm-hmm. and his wife was the treasurer and his brother was the pastor at a, a, a sister church and then his whole family was in charge of everything there. And then every time they do a new church plant or a youth pastor or worship pastor, it was insane. The amount of people that were in this small family that were in charge of this whole network of churches. Mm-hmm. And it turned into like the head pastor guy was in some serious rough stuff with like a worship leader that was a younger gal. Mm-hmm. And uh, it all came crumbling down because of that. And it flipped into the pr- other perspective of like this weird dominating like pastor relationship because even after he was – uh, denounced from the church. Most of his family members were denounced from the church. He moved halfway across the country. He would still text the family and just be like, hey, just so you know, I'm still praying for you, and I, I want to make certain I know where you're at and want to know this different stuff. Great. And, like, you could tell the heart was less about, like, reconciling the relationship that existed before to still living that power fantasy of I may not be in charge of the church that you're a part of any longer, but I still want to be in control of this Yeah, right. and know that I'm still your link to your salvation and I'm still your link to your faith. And it's still very real. I may have moved a thousand miles away, but I'm still there. Yeah. And it was just, that's it creepy. Was, yeah, it was terrifying. Yeah, I was yeah. like, what is happening right now? And, and that may or, may or may not be a cult, but it's certainly out of line Right, exactly. Yes, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That some of the stuff he has here on on his list is, is not. I mean, I think cults definitely have that, but some churches flirt with it. Yeah, mm. and they're still churches, but they just they just need to, to get in line a little more. Well, I think the um, identifier of whether or not you're a part of a cult isn't the most important piece there. Like you yeah. probably know, to be honest with you, if you're a part of a cult, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things to take from this of warning signs in general for yeah, yeah, yeah. what kind of uh, communities you're a part of. Yeah. Not necessarily just the designation of am I a part of a cult or not, but am I seeing uh, ir- irresponsible and and um, dangerous relationships that are being developed in the community yeah. that I'm part of, and how can I be positive in the force of change towards that? Right, right. I mean, I've worked with a guy... Uh, in a, in a church setting where, where there was a lot of control going on, a lot of things going on behind the scenes that people didn't know. A lot of these things were happening. It wasn't a cult, but it was a corrupt leader for sure. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean, and, and the, church, the church crumbled because it was an unsolid foundation. Um, and and uh, so, so yeah, you have to kind of distinguish. And I think that's probably what the author's trying right, to get exactly. at is like, is your church doing cultish things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, maybe I'm just putting that through my own filter. Um some people are in actual legit cults, right, yes, but, but um, yeah, the place may not be on fire, but there may be a couple warning signs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and, and I think it's probably uh, in a grander scheme to look at it and go like, um, God is after submitted authority, mm-hmm. right? Like He will He will be your authority, um, but it's voluntary to submit to that, right? And yep. so, like, you find places that like churches that are like, hey. We need dudes to to mow this place every Tuesday. You're going to submit to spiritual authority, and you're going to get mowing. You know, like that's that's not really that's not really spir- like it's it's weird stuff like that where they start creeping into oddball like <laughs> sections of your life. You know, I'll and, tell you who you can date. Yeah, and, exactly. And when you, or yeah. if you can get married. I see, and, and it's, but it's way different if a young man comes up to me and goes, "Hey, listen, I'm I'm, I'm thinking about starting dating. Here's the gal." You know what do you what do you think? Right. You know that is I'm submitting to a guy that's older than me or has some spiritual authority yeah. over me and says, "Hey, I could just use your, your advice here." Yeah, that's getting guidance. Yeah. That's guidance, and like and 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 like everything, everything when it comes to God is a free will donation. Right. Right. God asks for your heart. He, he doesn't demand it. He asks for it, and you got to give it to him if you want to give it to him. You know, and like the, every everything, every sin that we try to avoid, every characteristic of Jesus we try to take on, it's all voluntarily. And so, like, everybody goes, hey, look, I, I'm, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit can make this change in me. I'm asking to be part of this. That's the way that God wants your heart and your submission. He doesn't, he doesn't put anybody in charge to take it by force from you. If you want to roll off the rails and act a fool, Jesus is going to come after you. But you can say no as many times as you want. Right. Yeah, I, you know, maybe one of the prime takeaways then of, like, if I, if I roll this up, is, like, I am... Is that the that difference between the responsibility and authority thing when it comes to how you think about leaders? Like, yeah. if from a leadership perspective, um, you have any human acting like they own you, 
they own your time, they own your actions. Um, that's that's a, that that's where the lines are starting to be crossed. Um, I have a very strong opinion on people who I feel like I have the responsibility to care for, but I I do not have. They don't answer to me. Mm-hmm. They answer to right. Jesus. Right. Um, and because I'm not like I'm not worth answering to. And if you don't recognize your own humanity in that, it doesn't mean that you know as a responsible party you don't have harsh hard conversations. It doesn't mean that you don't speak very clearly to them and say look and. and with the confidence that the Lord has given you to be the person who says these types of things um, and who God works through in that particular way. But when it starts to be th- that there's a sense of control as opposed to them humble serving you, even in ways you don't like, um, that I- I'd be cautious of that, whether whatever else surrounds you is the cold or not, because then you risk following a person who is leading you closer to them as opposed to closer to Jesus. Um, and sometimes they don't even intend to, for it to get askew like that. But, like, I, I think that's one of the major risks of... We've talked about putting pastors in, in bad positions with some of the way that the church is, is just set up to do with the various roles. But you also put the the pastor in a rough positions to have to be a face, to have to be um, someone who is, like, motivating an organization as opposed to someone who's just humbly serving that organization. Right. Um, the, what we're asking out of it puts them in a rough spot, and it puts them at risk. Um, and I think we have to be cautious. And so, not all of that's intentional manipulation. Some of it, like a guy just thinks this is my responsibility, and the only way they know to how to get behavior the way they want it is to try to assert some false level of control. But like, people always will—they'll always get away from that. Your kids will get away from that, uh, even as a parent. You—you you can only assert. I like. Uh, I have a, my, my oldest daughter, like, I just know it's been a, at least a few years. Like, what am I going to say? Can, can I possibly force her to do something? What am I going to do? <laughs> right. Like, she can run. She can, you know, she can probably evade me. What am I going to grab her and care? You're going to clean this room. Like, honestly, if she does not do it willingly, I don't, there's not like a ton of yeah, repercussions your toolbox here. ain't that high. Right. And like, the, the options that you might be able to use, you would never use. Like, right. they're inappropriate. And so like, it's that kind of thing where it's it's a sign of a bad leader when you're reaching for those types of toolkits, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that stuff. Um, and so I, I'd be cautious about that. Um, and it's one of the and and maybe also it'd be one of the things to be praying for your pastor about. I guess I think it's hard. I think you do have to be intentional about protecting that kind of thing, because just like a parent, where it's easy to go, look, I'm the parent, you do what I want. That like sometimes it's easier just to go, look, I'm the pastor, and you guys can't date. You need to listen to me. Yeah, you're going to chase them from your church, and then you're going to chase them from Jesus because they think you're the guy that knows, and they don't like what you're talking about, and not just because they don't like it, but like it gives them a bad impression of Jesus. That's why God was always upset with the Israelites. They can make their own choices, but they're they're shaming God's name and their behavior, and that's why God's irritated with them. That's why He goes the length He does to like, you know, do the justice to try to bring them back to right representation of Him into the world. And I think that's an important takeaway too, is from that that last bit you said about praying for your pastors. Is it's it's important to understand that whatever I, I appreciate the distinction between responsibility and authority there, like the responsibility that they feel being uh, the pastor of your community. Um, it, it's it's a difficult act to to balance because it is exactly that. Like you're not trying to bring the hammer of conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's not your it's not your hammer to swing. But at the same point in time, do you still have love and compassion and kindness for the people that are in your flock or whatever you want to call it and hope the best for them and want them to have a relationship with Jesus? And deifying your pastor in your community is never the right answer. But also the other line of it is realizing that they're human Mm -hmm. and prayer for them and the relationship that they have with God and the relationships that they have to to walk that that thin line from time to time, or probably at all times, is an important thing to you to, for you to recognize as a person in that community. Yep. All right, cult identified. Hey, maybe you're in a cult. And you want to talk to us about it? <laughs> uh, you can call the live from the path Bob Eisenhower complaint line. That's five one five five one seven. Hold on, I forgot it. Yeah, five one five five one seven zero zero eight five. That's 515-517-0085, the uh, Live from the Path, Bob Eisenhower, complaint line. You can uh, let us know. Now, here's the deal. I'm, I'm, I'm like half joking. I know some of you come from rough backgrounds, especially as kids. Your parents are involved in weird stuff, and you don't know yeah. about it until you get older, and you're looking around, and you're going, something not right about this. Yeah. And thank the Lord uh, for uh, the Holy Spirit and John Wycliffe and all the other people who made sure that you had an English Bible available to you so that you can read it every once in a while. You found it at the hotel. 
See, even the Gideons are in on this thing. And you took a read of it and you go, now, wait a minute. Were the Gideons a cult? Uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't think uh, I know what the Gideons are, no. to be honest with you. No. They're, they're, they're overzealous sometimes. Yeah. But they're excitable. Yeah. <laughs> they're excitable. They're not folks. a cult. They're just excitable. But they want me to join them and give them money. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. Like, I bet there are untold number of stories of someone in a hotel room for random reasons, yeah. doing whatever, uh, who picks up a scripture and looks around and goes, I never thought of that. And sometimes, even in the situation that we're talking about, where you wouldn't even know that the things you're doing or uh, that your parents did were not normal. In fact, that's one of the great shocks that I think that happens, and you got to be careful with kids, is that you, you, you bring them up in such a way that once they leave your house or your direct influence, they start seeing a whole bunch of stuff in the world. It blows up. And, and then it, it causes them to think, like, well, I didn't even know about this. Maybe my parents don't know about this. Maybe the people in my church don't know about this. And it starts to kind of make them think that what, they, what their foundation was built on um, wasn't a right representation of the world. Mm. One of my great cautions to high schoolish, college aged kids is that, like, once you start leaving some of your comfortable confines and getting out to a view of the world, like, what, how you see the world is, should always deepen. But if it flips, if it completely changes, you were sold a different bill of goods. Like, I would be very ca- – I, I went to uh, – when I was in college, like, I noticed this very thing is that there's a set of things that I believed, and then you go start meeting a bunch of different people from a bunch of different places. And, like, no joke, 90% of my life was different than maybe what I'd seen growing up. And it causes you to think that mine – the thing you grew up with was a very small thing and that the real world is like this. It's, 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 and it can easily confuse you into going, well, then maybe I throw out the small thing, and this is the new – what the whole world is. But, like, that isn't how it is. I think kids and parents, like, we have to reckon with the, a deepening world. So, like, as an example, one of the <laughs> – this, this is relevant to – a lot of the things that cause cause cultural rubs is like how many guy how many times have you sat and you grew up in a church environment uh, there ain't, there's no gay folk there at your church because they don't feel welcome they don't feel comfortable they don't like the teaching whatever multiple reasons and so like you go you go 20 years you never met a you never met someone who thinks that way or believes that thing and then you walk out into the world you start going to different places and you just start meeting folk who believe different things than you feel a different way uh, and you're like well that's that seems like an all right person and uh, <laughs> and then you're like well what for whatever reason how i grew up just made it feel like that this it was a caricature of sorts and not intentional even but like because you don't know anybody who's been in that type of situation or with that belief system or, or feeling or whatever uh it starts to make you question whether the things you knew from before were were right or not now here's the thing your world just got deeper you have to reckon with the world where <laughs> Here's the things you you were taught. Here's the things you believe. Here's the things you feel like God like saw that God is communicating, and then it got deeper because there's a person in front of you in a situation that you're not familiar with that you never had a chance to think through and even thought through at all when you were younger. Deeper. It doesn't mean the thing you knew already isn't true. It means how that how that applies to the world, how it looks like to be a person who believes this thing and interacts with a deepening world, like. It means that your world got deeper. But, like, I've met and, and dealt with people who they ran into that thing and they turned around and go, you know what? Then everything I knew from before must have been garbage. Mm-hmm. It's all gone. And you just flipped it. Now, I'm going to tell you that whatever new world you think you just interacted with, it's shallow. Because you have to reckon with all the stuff that you saw when you were growing up. All the right. things that were true. The Holy Spirit moving in people's lives. The differences in the situations you're in. The love and service of the church. Like, you can't just throw that out and go, well, here's the brand new reality. Your world got deeper. And it's a mat- it's it's a maturing adult thing to have to reckon with a deepening world and asking Jesus for help in that. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I think we just have to be cautious about how we think about those types of things and like what we what we are preparing our kids for it doesn't mean you dunk them in all the in whatever cesspool you can find and go well, see the world's deep son right like but it it does mean that we have to be careful about recognizing how deep the world gets and helping people deal with the depth of the world as opposed to setting someone up to completely dismiss what their foundation was because there's a whole unfamiliar world out there that has no um see doesn't seem to have a relevance to what they grew up with I think that's uh, uh, something that as as I get closer to like 
the possibility of being a father happening anytime you know soon um that terrifies me is is i honestly don't know what that truthfully looks like in in parenting of doing everything you can to raise your children in in the love and understanding of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit and glorifying the Father as you can. And then there being a point when, not to say you had total control up until the ter- time they turned 18 and then you just, like, go, bye, but, like, you can't, you can't save them from the world. Dan's turned a couple out into the world and that, go, well... That's what I'm saying. I did my like, best. <laughs> <laughs> it, it worries me from that perspective. Yeah. Is like, what is that... How do I... How do I even know that my fathering of my children mm-hmm. is going to be anything but me just doing my best to not fail at everything and and screw them up less than I was screwed up? Like, I feel like I hear that all the time when it comes to being a parent is, oh, you just do your best to not screw them up as much as you were screwed up. I want to do better than that, yeah. man. Yeah, I would yeah. say that is the legit output of the kids in my youth group. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how, what that looks like. Way to go, parent. <laughs> right, and, and the, I want more than that. Yeah. And like that scares the crap yeah. out of me because I, I don't want to turn out a, a, a little bit better than me. Yeah. Like I want them to know who God is, and, and that scares the crap out so of me. So there had to have been that moment for you, Dan, like when oh, kids go off to college or whatever, when you're just like, right now – I no longer oh yeah 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 am able to shape it the way I used to right. and, and part part of the part of doing this I think successfully I mean they still have to catch it I mean so it's not like you do it this and it's gonna work yeah but I had to keep an eye on what you were saying there there's the wider world there's stuff out there 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 is a, a world that I'm not personally exposing them to but I know either they have been or will be yeah uh, and you know it's it's there so it's not like they can escape right. the realities of what's out there. Uh, so while trying to protect their innocence uh, as a parent, uh, you, you know, you would introduce uh, the fact that is out there mm-hmm. in, in, in a way that was understandable, relatable to their age without, yeah. you know, yeah, doing some of the stuff that some of the schools are doing these days. Uh, y- you and, and you man, you surround that with prayer. Now, that's the that, right. you, you know, I mean, I don't, that's the cliche answer. But but it's like, man, I prayed a Power. lot. I, now I pray for a grandchild, you, you know, right. then whatever influence I, I have there. And and uh, but yeah, it's it's frightening thinking you're you're sending them out into this world of uh, where there is an enemy who wants to devour them, and uh, in a world where many are in full process of being devoured, you know, right. And and saying, how do you build that character that says, yeah, the whole world's going this way. I'm going to still, I'm going to be, I always related it to like, the, if, what if you were a child of Noah? You know, somehow they made it on the boat when literally none of their friends were living like them. Right? <laughs> I mean, right. there wasn't like, they, you're right. Everybody is doing it differently. Right. So right. just pretend I'm Noah and, and you're my child. <laughs> so that multiple times, multiple times. Oh, man. And so th- that was just in the back of their mind that, that just because all the cool people are doing whatever, maybe they're wrong. You know, you know, yeah. and and I didn't down you know grade him. I didn't you know slam him or anything. I just right. didn't, you know just follow the scripture. Keep your eye on. God. Yeah, yeah. I so. think I've just I've I've been a witness to I don't even know how to say it, the bubble popping. Yeah, like I've 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 seen the the spiritual bubble that was created around a child for years and years and years of protection and well meaning protection from I'm I'm trying to keep you from the filth of this world mm-hmm. pop and then it's just like oh that's a rush I I, I can't even imagine that. Like mm-hmm. I, I went to public school and I had plenty of run-ins with the world before I turned eighteen, and all that stuff. I can't imagine being one that didn't. And yeah. it's crazy to me. But I, it's the tightrope, I guess, between trying to figure out how to protect them, but then also how to. How to I hate the word expose, but like educate them. I, I like on, de- I, like that word deep and keeps getting it to because like it, yeah, it is a reality. Yeah. It's not a it's not just a it's not a faceless fact. Right. What they're running into is the world. And this is this is where I think actually you're seeing a lot of people from a reformed background who are either leaving the faith or turning like what you would call very progressive. Yeah. It's because they they you spend all your time in books and you you got very firm understanding of like oh, I submit to God, I submit to uh, spouse and uh, I do the thing and I'm a sinner and everybody knows I'm a sinner. We all agree we're all sinners here. Uh, and then and then it just you start meeting people right. and like you, you will love people. God has put it in you to love people, and so you're going to start making relationships with folks 
with from that come from different backgrounds and different situations and and it's going to start opening your eyes you're like ah this isn't everybody was a cartoon to you right like when you grew up in a in a christian situation where like all those other things are like so easily like uh, they have the twisty mustaches and I and we don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Jesus people no mustache. Everyone else mustache. And then you're like, well, these people have the same problems I have. Uh, and they've a, and that person had a rough background from the parents, and I sympathize with that. And it looks like that person got burned by the church, like legit. Something in a church caused that person right. to be all burned up. And so you you start going. <sighs> I feel like I missed something. Mm-hmm. Like, like I just got I got given the pamphlet with all the good news, and I never read the underlying contract. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so then what you start doing is you start giving up stuff. But like, there's the thing: Jesus gets in your craw, and he won't leave. And so you start hanging on to little sinews. But you're like, but there has to be room for dealing with these situations that I right. don't think were included. That's a failure. That's a church failure. It's a human mm-hmm. failure to properly reflect Jesus and how we gather and what we think and what we talk about. Because, like, your world, the complications of getting deeper should be our business. That was Jesus' yeah. business. It was very easy to show up and call balls and strike. Overly religious. You're out. You, what you just, you'll take rescue. You know that you need it. Hands up. You're in. Like, very easy he could do that. But what is he doing? Like, you look at these different groups of people. He's reaching for the deep. He's the deeper well man. He's going around and finding, here's what it looks like to get rid of the basics things and start the complication of the lady at the well. The complication of the, of the woman caught in adultery in Johnny. Like, the complication of um, uh, the religious folks who don't know quite what to do with them. Uh, the, and the, I'm blanking the guy who comes in the middle of the night. Oh, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> yeah. he's complicated. Yeah. Joseph yeah. of Arimathea is complicated. The ladies following him around and funding his ministry. These are comp- These are deep. These are deepening things. And so, I, like, I say all that to say, if, if we think about where there's a frustration at times, we're like, what are all these people? They feel like they're bailing from orthodoxy here. And they're, and they're letting things infiltrate. I, I might submit to you that part of that is because – Orthodoxy has not always been rightly in the business of deepening. They shouldn't have to be let it in. We should be going out. Mm-hmm, we should right. be looking out and making and, and and so like these don't seem like foreign concepts. It doesn't mean that there's not complications with like well this person says they feel and and believe this way about themselves or about something else and Jesus as far as we can tell still doesn't align with that. Uh that's a complication, but we should be in the deep on things like that so that you don't feel like you got sold a bill of, bill of goods and that there's a whole new world out there that you were deprived of. The thing is you're still treating them like cartoons. That's the part that you're missing, right? Like it, the more you get – the deeper you get to know people, the more you realize that, that, that what they're choosing are outputs of mess, are outputs yeah. of complete mess. And like you, you, you get one step in and go, they've got it all figured out. They know a thing that I don't. That's true. That's still they cartoons. Understand the, they, like you're still looking at them as if they're a 2D character – in your world, but like get to really know them. Uh, it's coming from mess. Right. That's where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. And so, like God gave you the, the 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 opportunity and the scripture and the eyes and the Holy Spirit and the and the to see mess and to avoid it. And and then and then when you meet folks that are like they they believe something completely opposite of God. Nine out of ten, ninety nine out of a hundred, it was born out of mess, and it came from mess, and now it's just mess growing up. And so don't. It's it, it, you're treating them less than you're looking at them as if they're a cartoon example of these different other ways to be, and like what you're missing is actually knowing them. Because if you were to get in there, what you're going to find out is that is is someone told them a lie, and they believed it, or maybe maybe they told themselves a lie and believed it, and they've been operating off a mess for years, and and like you have to get to know somebody to know whether that's true or not. Mm. Yeah, it, yeah. To to find someone that believes something different than you, where it feels like it opened your eyes, it comes with it, this belief that well, they have the world figured out. They've right. sorted, and they've taken in both sides, and they've ended up here. That often isn't the case. They often didn't take in whatever your foundation was. They 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 were grasping. They were looking for something to hold on to. They didn't hold on to Jesus, but they found something that gave them definition or right. identity. They found a they found a finger hold on a mountain. They didn't find a chair. Right. Right, they didn't find a comfortable bed. They found something that could hold them up under their own steam, and right now it's working. And for the and for the first five minutes of holding yourself up by the finger holds, you are ecstatic. Yeah, finally, I got something. You're like, at least I got something to hold on to. And you know what? This feels darn good. And then and then ten minutes in, you're like, my arm hurting a little bit. 
and 15 minutes in, the bird come flying by, pecking at you. Now you got an itch, and you're like, you know what? This isn't holding very well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and and the problem is, is like you have to look at somebody so shallowly to walk past them in the first five minutes and go, man, look how much adventure and awesomeness they and really greatness they have. They've got this all figured out, you know, and like. You're, you're no, you have no idea about the mess, and you didn't care enough to ask. And then you went off and made a bunch of decisions based on a half of a story you know and, and, and miss all the hurt and pain that comes from being the guy hanging from the rock. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, it's, I'm just saying, like, you, you don't actually love people. Like, like I'm, and I'm talking to, to Christian folks that are struggling with cultural things that you feel like are, like, like, like Christianity is not handling well or we're not loving towards, and, and like, I'm with you. We got a bad attitude about loving people and loving them holistically and loving them well. And like I, I, I would say that we get we get nailed with that a lot, and and it's true half the time, right? We could do better in this area, but at the end of the day, you really have to love somebody to and know them well to figure out and take some of the confidence off of the decisions that they've made, and all of a sudden act like they know something that you don't. You have a personal relationship with the Creator of the world who has told you all the things you need to know to operate this world with joy and and peace and comfort and confidence to tell other people about the same good news you have. And you get tossed aside by one guy hanging from a rock whose forearm is burning and you're like, man, he's living all the adventures. <laughs> yeah. He's about to fall down like fun. from the adventures. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's difficult, but actually, it made me think about what was the, the the cult business, where you have people who lead other people, and it's primarily based upon this this infallible authority. You didn't expose the deep to anybody. You made it sound like you got the world figured out. Like I'd much rather have my kids and the people who I I pastor to, to recognize that I that I swim in deep. So like there isn't this impression that if they only know the things that I said to them, that they completely got sold a bill of goods on the view of the world. Like it's just wrong. It's a it's and it gives the wrong perception of how the world works. And like if what you believe totally changes because you met someone in a situation that you never contemplated, um, then then like we're not we're not jumping on the the trampoline of faith here. Like you just put a poster up on the wall and stared at it. And like I think we have to give it some room to breathe and if we think if we think good news changes the world good news still turns the world upside down positively for the kingdom um then it should be out there they're walking around and doing work and and not fear any situation that might occur there's no personal environment or personal situation or background that could come to me and go like well you know what maybe jesus isn't the lord and it sounds silly to say that but like because if we don't talk about or give people, whether it's kids or maturing kids or adults even, the ability to see like how Jesus interacts in those situations, then it makes it sound like, well, he lives over here. He, he's Jesus is Lord of white people with a median income. Okay. False. False. Uh, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is Lord everywhere. Um, where are we restricting that so that that message doesn't come through well? And where where do we need to make sure that we've not bound it in ways that it sh- it ought not be bound? Hmm. You're listening to Life from the Path. Uh, hey, b- before before we we move on to advice, um, I just uh, hopefully Mike's all right with this. I wanted to share this with you because like it just keeps sticking with me. Mike gave an example yesterday for worship, and like the image just just not shaken from my head. Uh, well, Mike, maybe maybe you say it, uh, and then I will expand upon it. Uh, was it in the expo? Here's the thing: is what I don't think you realize is I didn't actually give that example. You did. Oh shoot! <laughs> well, I'm brilliant. Delightful. Yeah, I had Boy, given. I, it, did that. I, had, yeah, I was self-serving <laughs> boob. I, well, here's the thing: is I was talking about worship and what it looked like and, and 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 a good way to think about it. And I and I had I had said my thing, and we were about ready to play a song, and Ben goes, "That is an excellent example." And then he went on to explain something completely different that I didn't actually say. That absolutely did happen. <laughs> I was there for that. It was exactly how that went down. And I was going to interrupt him, and I thought, "This is the Holy Spirit time. It's not my business." Okay, I'm gonna stand this. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna tell. You, so I will. Sh- I, I just think this is. I thought this was cool, and so maybe this is helpful to people. I appreciate that you call know, out so much. Yeah, I thought I totally nailed this. Here we go. <laughs> I, no, I thought you said it. Holy Spirit, talk through me. As, as far as, as, far as I remember. A cult. This was your example. 
spiritual authority. It's not even occurred to me. I didn't think it was me. So what I heard you say was that, like, as we're worshiping, like, like God works through worship in such a way that, like, it it allows how he is speaking, like, words of scripture or how he was speaking to, to soak in. Like, there's something about singing to God or things that God has said that that basically allow things to saturate in that you otherwise may not hit. And so what 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 it felt like or what I heard you saying was basically that, that this this act of, of worship is is basically tilling of the ground. So so whereby by you submitting in an act of worship to God and singing something, it allows words and movement of God to soak into your life in places where it maybe it just bounced. Maybe it just wouldn't stick that way if someone just said it or if, even if you were, you were you read it on a sign somewhere or something. And so like by by participating in worship, you're basically volunteering. You're saying, I'm op- – till me. Till up the ground so that whatever you have for me may soak in. And so not only did that stick with me when I thought about worship and like how active it is, not only as an offering back to God, but I think God is working in you in return for that worship. He's saying, great, now I'm giving you more of me, not more of delight because you were singing, not more of, oh, you're memorizing scripture with the words because that's great. It's, it's in response to you offering worship to me, I will give you – I'm making it a way, a means of which through you get more of me. And then like – that thought then expanded to me about I think that's true in some way or another with almost all spiritual discipline type of thing. Like as opposed to just going like what is what am I doing with prayer? Well, I'm, I'm trying to have an interaction with God. I'm trying to, to, to offer him something to open and create space of which God and I can be in relationship. But it feels like the same thing by – by, by submitting in prayer, posturing in prayer, just taking 30 seconds, 10 minutes, whatever it is, out for prayer, I, it just feels like the physical act has a tilling effect that starts to stir and open up things and so that whatever God is moving in your life can soak in. And your Bible reading is the same way. What am I doing? Am I just taking in words? Like you can take in all kinds of words, but there's something different about sitting and focusing time and saying, I'm going to read my Bible and I, the very practice of opening up the app or opening up the, the the Bible I have in front of me and turning a page, it just feels like the physical nature of it is has a tilling effect. And so I don't I don't want to overstretch like the realities of of it, but like that that hit me very hard yesterday because it made me think, it made me appreciate the acts of worship and spiritual disciplines and things that God gave us, not just as I will submit to it because God loves it and I want to make God happy. I, th- I think there's something in there that says in reaction to do these things that God called me to do, it almost creates like, a, oh, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use an elevated word here, but like it's, it's almost an anointed moment. Like there's something about doing that thing that then creates fresh ground for God to work with, whereas if someone was just talking scriptures, you walk by them, it might bounce. Does, this, does that make sense? You think part of it is because you're using both your left and right brain at the same time, and it's just firing things that... I mean, not to discount the Holy Spirit. In no, it, the Holy I'm Spirit had nothing to do with this. It's more of a physiological response. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, some, you know, that all works together. I mean, God sometimes God gives us tools yeah. because he knows how we work. Yeah. You know, you're unlocking some something that you... Purely by emotion wouldn't get, and purely by logic oh, wouldn't get. Right, but you're melding them together and going. Oh, and, and. The comma is a combination of of emotion, logic, spirit, physical. Like you're basically yeah. all all capacities is saying open, and but it takes having to speak the thing. It takes having to turn yeah. the page, yeah, or yeah. flip the app, or bow the head, or whatever it is. So I was just a thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, anyway, I just like maybe that. Um, just in case you, anybody's listening, if you think about. Like maybe you struggle with these things. I really struggle to read my Bible or like I kind of sing quietly or or not at all when it's worship (laughs) time. Prayer seems like I'm just standing there. I just – if it helps to think about – it has been helpful to me to think about, hey, man, it's it's till in time. By doing this thing, by dedicating this moment or these moments to God in singing and worship or reading my Bible or praying, um, it has the effect of – breaking down barriers that I might be having to hearing and interacting with God for whatever he may have for me. And I like till and soil so that seeds can fall through and, and not just bounce off me, my protective shell of life that just lets things kind of not soak in. Um, 
that image just stuck with me. So that maybe, since Mike didn't intend to say it, uh, maybe that was just for me alone. But whatever, in case it's helpful for anybody, uh, I just it's still sticking with me like 24 hours later. Yeah, I actually went back and watched the video. I'm like, did I say something like that? Just make sure the Holy Spirit didn't take over me, and I was yabbering without me knowing about it. And so I said, a, I said something completely different. Ben's like, that's a great example. Yeah, chill in the field. <laughs> I'll have you know that I thought you said that. Like, I know Mike, you didn't say those exact words, but like that was the picture. Mike, like, your I'm comment good. about agric- agriculture really made me think about <laughs> tilling fields, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, I was glad to have been a part of it, I guess. <laughs> Well, it's like someone giving a, a 30-minute sermon to some guy coming at the end and going, you know, that really changed the way I look at my reactions to my family. And he's like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> right. <laughs> talking about like I think I they, just, I I like think they built connected. on each other. They built on <laughs> they're like they're connected. Yeah. There's a common ground. Okay, ready for some advice? Yep. Dear life from the path. I have recently discovered that for the last seven years or more, my husband has been lying to avoid conflict. Well, he's like... Most dudes. Yeah, that's not a, <laughs> yeah, that sounds that's not a about right. Yeah. <laughs> what he has been lying sounds about like greatly point. upsets me. But knowing he has lied about these things makes it worse than finding out the truth at the time things happened. Boy, this is vague to the maximum. The lies are about his relationships with his female, quotes, friends. He has always had a wondering eye. He has lied so many times that I'm wondering what else he has lied about that I don't know about. I found out because he tells on himself without realizing what he has said. I'm now questioning our whole life together. We have now been together 31 years, and I've been thinking our entire marriage has been built on lies. When I confront him about it, he says, he never said that, but he did say it. How do I live with a lying spouse? Maybe you should be more, give more details. (laughs) You say, this is kind of, that's, there's not much to go off of here. Yeah, you'd basically put a a blank poster on the wall and said, see that? (laughs) Uh, uh, (laughs) I mean, maybe respond with, yeah, since you gave us nothing, we're going to go ahead and say, you should pray about your marriage. You should talk to your husband more, and maybe you should talk to someone else about your marriage with it, your husband. It, did he cheat on you? Is that what we're getting at? Did he? It, the it was, nature of her, his female friendships, I think, maybe? I don't know. Maybe they're just like inappropriate friendships, but not quite cheating. I or, mean, if, if, if you there's say, a distinction. If I'm questioning our whole life together, and I'm thinking our entire marriage has been built on lies, if you've now found out that he has cheated on you, then yes, your entire marriage has been built right. on lies. <laughs> yeah. There's and no so, if and or but about that. So That's I feel what's like happened. she doesn't actually know that. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess she overreacts to things. Yeah. And that's his, he's normal, he's used to that, so rather than have her overreact to whatever, did you put mustard on your burger? No, I did not. And there's yellow dripping off of it, you know. Uh, he just doesn't yeah. tell yeah, the, the truth. Yeah, the statement of to he avoid tells the on conflict. himself without realizing it sounds incredibly like, I think I know what he's saying. Yeah, but maybe, and maybe he, his eye wanders, but there's a lot... There's a big difference in your eye wandering and having an affair. Right. Not, not, I'm not acknowledge. I'm not you know saying it's okay to have a wandering eye. I'm, I'm, but I'm just saying that maybe she's overreacting. Maybe. Mm, yeah. We, maybe. Maybe. Write us another letter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the deal. Like we take repeats. We'd like to give uh, good advice that is based on solid scriptural understanding and overall love for people. There is just not enough here to speak any type of wisdom into. Right? Like, if you found out your, your husband should not be lying to you, that's true. We don't believe that lying is a good defense mechanism for a spouse that overreacts. Um, right. Now, if you have not always been this way and you've, like, become this way and, like, you are very harsh on everything that he does, do I understand why he would want to do something like that? Like, let's say that he. Uh, he works in an office building and is doing a project with uh, w- with Bernice, and you would flip out about this, but he is the sole breadwinner in your house and must do projects with Bernice. Right. Uh, yeah, you've put him in a pickle, and he has probably lied to you about it, and I don't think that was probably the way to go, but I, I would understand it a little bit more than the complete vagaries that you've presented. I'm just saying, like, there's the the actual story would help clear up. Where some of this is coming yeah, from. Yeah, 31 years together also, if done poorly, is a long time to pack on a lot of emotional baggage and damage and ability to misunderstand, like, statements and, you know, misrepresent quotes from your husband or all that kind of stuff. Like, there, there's a chance that this is just way out of whack because of a lot of junk and it can't really be unpacked here. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Phyllis? Pray. No. 
Solid. <laughs> Sailor says, solid marriages are built on trust. Unfortunately, yours is lacking in that department. Your first task is to determine whether you want to remain married to a lying husband. Whoa. Who attempts That's the first task? Wait. Ooh. Who attempts to gaslight you by denying he has said something you clearly heard. It would be in your best interest to schedule some sessions with a licensed counselor who can help you to gain enough emotional strength to make that decision rationally rather than emotionally. If you decide to end your marriage, discuss this with an attorney before informing your husband so he or she can guide you in the process. Wow. Secular has the easiest job on the planet. Yeah. yeah. You should get a divorce. And if you decide not to, you should do counseling. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I, I go, yeah, do the counseling because the counselor right. is also going to see if you're overreacting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. totally. You know, they'll be more objective. There's a mediator in communication. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm Now, I do wonder, are there, uh, there are like non-licensed like licensed people who could just like you can just have to do mediation? There are people out there. Not like mediators, not like professional mediators. But either. like a friend or I, a... Yeah, I'm just well. It's like it can't be an associate because, like, really, most yeah. most marital problems don't require some of that some of that deep skill that people have. They just need someone to go. Uh, That's I wrong. know you're listening to your own voice over here, and I know you're listening to your own voice over here, and you think both of each other are dumb. Can let me tell you, you actually sound wrong here. Hey, yeah. man, if you're needing someone like that, might I recommend a call to the live from the path complaint line? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do believe that uh, that at that number, there may be someone that may not have all the licensure that you think you need, but may have the ability to go, ha, yeah. I think you're hearing that wrong. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's play that one back on it. I like to assume that no matter who's asking me for advice, they are the root of the problem. <laughs> I think that might be 12 years of dear life from the path. Though. I like to start there, and they can convince me out of it. But I like to start with the fact that, I think you're probably to blame. Just for this. to set our common ground, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Prove it to me that you're not. So, so this gal comes to us and, and sits down across the uh, the table. Uh, you know, there's there's questions you, you ask, like, can you give me some, some specific right. lies? Like, like what has he lied about, and what did he really do? Right. You know, How and then start unpacking some of that, yeah. and and because it does matter. Yeah, absolutely. And then ask him, well, why did you why did you lie? You know. Well, because she was going to overreact. Right. Hates, Thirty-one I mean, years ago, her, her their marriage didn't start with her perceiving him as lying and everything right. and telling on himself. Right. There's a lot of stuff that has led to her fully believing that yeah. he is telling on himself and that there are lies that exist. And, and, and so let's be honest, happened. We're, we're lazy guys. Absolutely, we are. So, I mean, in relationships, we're lazy. So you know, if it's a lot easier just to say no, I didn't eat yesterday, rather than to say. I eat that cookie. Yeah, yeah. right. I didn't right. even eat. Oh, never yeah. mind. I Couldn't find myself me. more often than not saying no, that didn't bother me. And, and that's, did. that's the lie that I tell. Is like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, no, that that no, wasn't this... rude. Yeah, and that didn't bother yeah, me in any no way, problem. shape, or form. Because it's way easier to just be on the other side of that wasn't rude, other than saying. Then you got to wade yeah, through all was. the stuff. Let's yeah. talk about why it was rude. <laughs> that saying. sucks. Yeah, actually, that's true. Boo was convicting me right here. Like I will tell lies to avoid getting into some kind of. Even if I was the one affronted, yes, yes. Yeah. it's yeah. fine. Well, because it feels like you can't, it's, you don't know how to sort it out. Especially yeah. right. like the longer you're married, the more you see the same thing coming. You've been talking about the same Choose thing your for, battles. for yeah. a decade or two. Right. <laughs> you're two decades in, and you're like, you know, if I say this, she's going to say this, and I say this, and, she's gonna, and we still, we've disagreed on this for 15 years. And so, you know, no, that no, I'm fine. I'm not irritated at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I you know, am. But no, I'm not. And yeah. he's going, okay, I noticed she's probably a 36C, but I, if I say that, that's going to offend her because she's going to think I'm thinking things. And I'm like, ah, I just, I just, hey, man, I just thought that. Right. That's I mean, a real situation where if I see somebody on the side of the road that I know has a wacky outfit on, I sometimes don't mention it because I don't want it to turn into a, hey, man, were you looking well, over there? What were you, you looking, looking at that for? Yeah, because my eyes were in that it's direction and yeah. she was wearing a panda suit. <laughs> yes. I mean, sorry. <laughs> yeah. like, like head I, I wasn't toe looking toe for a new suit. wife. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you looking at that lady? Yeah. She was in a panda suit. You've always been attracted to pandas, haven't you? Dang it. I have been. Skin tight's all right. <laughs> what do you think, baby? Yeah. Well, right. That's the thing, though. I would never let a dude pass. Like, if I, yes. pass, if I yes. passed a dude in a panda suit, I'm like, look at that Mongolian rocking that panda suit. Look at that crazy man. That is insanity. Even a straight-up naked dude. I'd be like, woman, naked dude, check it out. <laughs> no naked problem. lady. I looked over there the whole yeah. time. Did you I see that see naked nothing. woman? I see no naked woman. What? There was a lady in the, in the vicinity? I didn't yeah. notice. I was counting windshield wiper clicks. Yeah. yeah. I just saw the girl with the turtleneck. I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't a turtleneck? I was pondering whether, the, you know, can the defrost hear? That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Sometimes I like to whisper back to it, shh. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. See, now this is this goes back to our. Do you evangelize? You're pulling stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm not going to say that because it could be get get me into trouble. Yeah. Crap. I might, I might not be as honest as I think. I mean, I think I'm pretty honest. But but uh, like the question like like hey, are you upset? No, everything's fine because you know I will get over it faster than this conversation. Right. Will take. Like I will I will go. You know what? I yeah. actually was upset, but I was wrong, and I know I was wrong. So if you would just let five minutes pass, I'll get over this thing pretty fast. Yeah. Deal, man. And a sexy, you take in a weeks. sixty second dig into the way that I think about it, not going any further than that. My whole thought process is I don't deserve to bring up that something has been wronged against me. Is because I am a general boob in most situations and could be called upon as being an idiot all the time. And so I could call her out on the one thing and go, well, yeah, that did aggravate me a little bit or that annoyed me for a second. But then I have to reckon with she literally lives with me and puts up with me on the daily. And I am dumber than a bag of rocks. And so it's not worth it to bring up the one thing. I'm not worth that thought, and so that's where I run into it. So I don't know if it's me trying to avoid honesty or me just trying to judge myself way too harshly. I don't know. It might be a combination. Well, I, so I think there is – there is. just think about it, their general position towards the advice. Is that like – I think at its core, I would look at it and say, I'm, I'm wrong in here somewhere. Even if I've been offended, right. I'm probably yeah. overly yeah. reacting. Like, is it worth saying something? Yes, for the health of your marriage, it's worth saying something. Yeah. Because if someone loves you, they would want to know that they've said something that's offensive to you. They might not even have noticed it. It probably isn't worth whatever you feel invested in it in that first 30 seconds. I had to apologize. In fact, I was right. on my way here to the show tonight, and I, I had to apologize to my wife. I was cranky. Uh, I was supposed to uh, – she got up early, and uh, we got chickens, and someone needs to take care of the chickens early. I start work like 8 a.m. or so, and once I'm in work and like I'm generally not free for three or four hours, the chickens have to be taken care of. So if I don't get up with any space and time, it's basically my wife take care of chickens. And what it feels like to her is like, oh, well, you just you know you sleep, just sleep as late as you want to, and then you can avoid doing the chickens. Now that wasn't my motivation. Frankly, we went to bed at like 2 a.m., but we both went to bed at 2 a.m. And so you know, right. like, uh, so she, she, there was she was right. She was right that like, hey, this felt this felt rough. I, I don't know. Maybe I don't love how she brought it up. But the reality was that she was probably right. Um, but then like here's the thing. That feeds into like that feeds into all kinds of other things which you're probably sensitive about in your marriage, yep. especially sensitive about someone who knows enough for you to be sensitive about it. Like you can't put her, you can't put on this woman that you've been around. She's well aware of your behavior. Right. Uh, and so when you get away with like you maybe, maybe well, not this room, but like. You know, oh, yeah, and I'm not normally late, and so uh, sorry about that. People can just write it off. Your lady knows that you're late all the time or that you really did buy 13 donuts and showed up at 12. Like, she knows this stuff. And so um, I think that's that's the hard part is that I think you do need to be able to share it, but you probably always need, like, a good buffer that says, do I not share it as a return punch? I share it as a, all right, now that I've accepted, because I think you should accept where I'm either overreacting or should own whatever this offense is. And yet, uh, I, this, it, I took it in rough. Part of it was maybe how you approached it. And so totally, I hear what you're saying. I might take it in better if you tried something yeah. like this. Smooth the edges inter- internally for a second, then yeah. bring it out. And it may or may not last. And like, I still feel like you're going to spend time. It's just a, dude, fellows are pragmatic. And we go, I can, we can talk about this for 20 minutes. But like in all reality, I'm going to say that this, that, was kind of offensive, and she's going to go, I don't know why you found that so offensive. <laughs> and uh, and then I'm wrong on the other end And so maybe yeah. I just don't spend 20 minutes on it, you know? <laughs> Especially if you know you're going to lose. I don't know how many times I thought I, we're going to start a discussion, and I'm yeah. like, one minute in, I'm like, I'm beat. i got to get out of this thing. I was right, I was, she was right the whole time. i gotta, I got to stop. Yeah. Hey, and, man, I'm definitely not speaking <laughs> on, a, on a level of authority in marriage. I'm in like two years in, but like the best ways those ever come out is by starting my – I don't even want to call it a grievance, annoyance, by talking about how I can – how e- – empathizing about where her brain probably was when it happened and just go, okay, this happened, and I think this might be where you were at, but this is where I was. But I've, I've, I've fully considered where I know you were, and, and it, tell me if I'm wrong here, but, like, on the other end, this is where it felt. Does that – does that have any ground with where you're feeling? Like, do you get where I'm coming from of where I know where you were at, but here's where I felt it? And does that make sense? I That's so. some of the best conversations I've ever had with my wife. Is that going, feels dangerous to me. Oh, you think you know me? <laughs> 
See, you don't know me and, at all. And, 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 <laughs> I, I have I Grace was thinking as like, close Ooh. to being there. No, and here's the deal. I have Grace in this because I married a, an angel on earth, and that woman gets my brain more than anyone ever has in my entire life. And she goes, okay, that's nowhere near where I was at, actually. <laughs> Thanks for trying. Um, I appreciate that you attempted to get where I'm at, but let me tell you where I was but actually But it wasn't at. really an attempt, was it? It was showered in you and you only, and here's why. Well, she knows my heart on it well enough, and, and this is why I'm saying in some situations, I'm certainly not a, a, a practitioner of this at all times and can talk on authority. I, can I just really say, think it's probably a good way to bring things up. I've never tried that route. I've just gone with the accusatory. <laughs> yeah. I, I was really good at that the first six months because any time I did bring it up, I was like, oh, yeah, I got some beef. Like, my wife isn't perfect after all. All right, man, here's where I was at. But now I'm into it a little bit more, and I'm just like, okay. I know that that wasn't meant to be this way. How was it meant to be? And how did I take it? Well, I mean, if I bring it up from that perspective, that's not like me jabbing at her. That's me going, okay, your heart was here, and I know it was, because I know you. I married you. I know your mind. I know your heart. This is where I was. There was some, there was some shaky ground in there. <laughs> in boobery land, <laughs> where I live. <laughs> you know, actually, I will tell you, though, I think that is one of the risks in longer time. Like, the longer you're married, um, like, you have to give your spouse the freedom to to change, to be different. Like, one of the risks that you run is you're 15 years – I don't know how long I've been married. 16 years? 17, something like that. And, like, there's probably – if my wife says something, especially something that might be offensive to me. Right. Like, I, got, I know in the back of my mind I'm like, yeah, this is what she's, this is what she's after. <laughs> this is what she thinks. Now – it's probably – maybe it's something we've been talking about for a long time. I've been trying to say, look, here, that's not – you shouldn't think that way. That's not really true or blah, blah, blah. But, like, I don't give her any motivation to change if I don't give her the space to change by not just assuming that that's what she's doing. And so, like, sometimes couples that have been married for a while, they're hair trigger because, because again, you see a conversation about seven steps ahead and you're like, I know where this is going. <laughs> but here's I played the this thing, chess game before. The, the, because, like, well, I know this person and we've gone down this path before. Um, but legit – like, you can't – how could I change? What motivation is there for me to grow from the last 150 conversations we had about this and try to react differently if you're going to tag me with it anyway? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, unfortunately, fellas, I think we probably can't bail on those conversations because you can't actually either have change or witness it if you presume that whatever – even if you've had that same thing 100 times – I mean, if you want one. if you want it to go away, to grow and mature, you're going to have to let it play out one on one to see yeah. if it to see if it moves. Because um, I, I know that like like there's there's been times where my wife is like like I know you and I know this is what you think and I'm like I don't think that I have never thought that <laughs> now, you got got to let that go. But she's got it in her mind that that's right. what I think, and I probably have done the same thing to her. And then like an innocuous statement that shows up over here, you're like I know what this is about. <laughs> this is about that thing again, <laughs> and like. It could be, but I don't know that. Right. And but like familiarity often gives us license to like start like you start sorting things out. You feel like if you're a person who solves problems, you can walk into a room and you just start seeing buckets. Like, okay, you got a people problem, you got a process problem, uh, the electricity's not working, blah blah blah. You start just sorting things out right away, and because you've done it before, and so you you run the risk in conversations in your marriage of kind of doing the same thing. Okay, you know, that's about her mom. Uh, that's uh, yeah, it just feels inadequate in this way or another, and uh, she thinks I think this person's prettier than her. Like whatever, you just start sorting conversations out, and it's not fair. It's not fair because now you've reinforced your belief, and so it just seems more and more true every time you think it. And it might have been not true the second time it occurred to you, but you just started using the buckets, and then you don't give you lose the ability to grow as a couple, and so it's a risk. Says Ben to Ben, uh, you you gotta you gotta let the stuff uh, you gotta let stuff play out. Yeah. Right, that Second was an impromptu advice. dear life in the path. It's it's always best to wo- to marry a woman who is right, <laughs> because then you can just at the start of every every argument you, know you can go, at. nope, you're wrong about this, dude. <laughs> you better figure out a way to figure out where you're at on that hey, directly. Somebody should have mentioned that to me before I got married. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> My okay. wife doesn't <laughs> listen to the show. <laughs> Last <Good> one. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. Here we go. Dear life from the path. I had a friend I adored. She was someone I had known for over 20 years, but I had to say goodbye to her. I realized she is a shoplifter and also do- <laughs> and also doesn't tip at restaurants. When she shoplifted, I was with her. I had no idea she was doing it until we got back to the car and one of the items fell out of her bag. I was appalled. I told her never do it again. 
when we were together, and I have tried not to shop with her since. I realized she wasn't leaving tips when her receipt blew away with a gust of wind. She was in the restroom when I picked it up and saw there was no tip for the server, who was working very hard. I told her I didn't feel comfortable going places with her under these circumstances, especially with how things have changed during COVID. The, the last straw was when I caught her trying to sneak into a musical event. There are musicians in my family, and I know how, how they and others have struggled during these hard times. She has more than enough money to cover these costs. I don't understand why she does it. The problem is I feel guilty. Should I reach out and suggest we do things that don't involve music, restaurants, or shopping? Maybe we can just go for walks and talk. I miss her friendship. You're going to find out she doesn't recycle. Ah. Uh, okay. I'm a, Who are I'm a you, go Nelson ahead and, Mandela? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb here and say you're probably one of those people that I have to love, but I, I don't think I'm going to like, and I'm going to be real honest about that. Also, I don't write the tip on my own receipt. That I take sticking. You don't know what right. she wrote. On I, your write the on the right. I write the tip on the receipt that goes to them so that they know what to take. Yeah. Not the one I take away because I don't – maybe I just don't have that level of commandment of my finances yeah. that I'm not keeping the $3 tip I put on my donut today. This is a woman who still keeps the check register after writing one at the Walmart. Yeah. And yeah. still yeah. writes so, the stuff in the back. So one – no. You do that, Dan? No. No. Okay. <laughs> you did – you kind of did a – and I thought, well, shoot, maybe Dan writes checks. To no, Walmart. okay. No. One of my best friends <laughs> took advantage of the fact that I was in a wheelchair for a while, and I found out that he was using my wheelchair to steal stuff from places we were going to. What? And I found that out by setting off the alarm at an FYE at the mall because he had snuck. Oh, Ozzy Osbourne's discography into my wheelchair, yeah. and then I set off the alarm and then flew through the rest of the mall. And he is one of my best friends to this day. Wait, did you you evaded? Like you, I, ran. I evaded the stands of the of the security guards by. I mean, I booked it out of that mall in my wheelchair. I was. You quick. didn't say, "Oh gosh, I have something I haven't paid for. Maybe I should go back in and give it back to them." I was 16 at the time. <laughs> you I just, just wondered. The turbos on I it. Didn't, I put the turbos on it because what I thought at the time was is that he walking out with me had stolen something. Not that I was the one who had the, the, <laughs> oh, the okay. so at best right. the you're contraband. An, you're an accomplice. Yes, at, at best worst, I'm an accomplice. You're part of the crime, without a doubt, part of the crime. Uh, and you wonder why you've been called to appear. <laughs> and I'm here. I, I've I've tried to amend my ways. I'm here so that I can own up to that Fye purchase F-Y or Englinger. non purchase. <laughs> non purchase. Uh, you're you're weird. Uh, I think I think this is a situation where you're looking for a reason to like hate on people. You're probably paranoid about yourself. Now hold on um, a minute. Let me. Uh, let me. Twenty ask, years of friendship. Let's take these. Talk it through. Let's take these things separately. Let's say you were going no. out with a friend of yours, and they're constantly shoplifting while they're with you. What is the right reaction? However, but that doesn't seem like the situation here. She's saying that she caught her once, and twenty years of friendship is broken because of it. I think the implication is that she caught her once. She which, doesn't feel comfortable going places with her under these circumstances. Especially with how things have changed during COVID. <laughs> okay, I, don't, I thought shoplifting was a problem pre-COVID. I was wrong. The opportunity for shoplifting has <laughs> really either increased or decreased based on the COVID. I actually think it's harder. There's not as many people out in the place. I think so she's saying economically you should tip your servers because of COVID. Uh, this that, was, this that's was where pre-server discussion. No, it? I think that's where the COVID conversation comes in is because she's saying with the economic term. Well, craziness, you should tip your servers. I caught her trying or to not s- steal from musicians. I caught her trying to sneak into a musical event like you were working security there. Or I you have were there sever- with her and she tried to bolt the gate. <laughs> or- I have, I have several say, musicians hey Martha, in my did family. Did you buy a chicken? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you were there together. <laughs> and you, right. You're waiting in line to go and she just starts scaling the fence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was weird. I'm picturing these people like 75 years old but right maybe they're not i don't trust any of this i don't trust any of this person's breakdown of what's happening all of it is told in such a comedic fashion right. that i can't 20 years of friendship i caught her one time and said never again right i mean she 40 oh well, I, I suppose what do you let's say let's say you met her when you were five she could be 25 <laughs> yeah. or she could be 40 either way she yeah. could be many ages this, this is, is a Seinfeld Seinfeld episode isn't it now hold on, you didn't answer my question though. You go out to you're you're going out with a friend, and that friend is constantly shoplifting while you're out. What do you do? Hey man, put that back. 
and they say, no, I'm not going to. I, I Put would, this in your wheelchair. If I if it was an actual situation where the, the person has been – I've talked to them multiple times, and they're just straight up klepto and will not stop. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a level where you can go, I don't think I'm going to hang out with you or go to retail yeah. stores anymore. Yeah. Like, we can't go to the Walmart together anymore because I've seen you steal that same floor mat four times, Karen. Yeah. I still got one for the back of the minivan to go. <laughs> Help me I, get the double. I watched out. you steal my birthday present this year. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, okay. So she, if if that was the background, she might be justified in saying, look, I'm not going out. Yes. I'm not going out with you. We can only go for walks at the park where I find out that I don't appreciate how you treat the, the recycling situation. Okay, now, server, server tipping. One, she doesn't know whether she tips or not. She's taken a weird piece of evidence. Right. But secondly, uh, are you Dutch treating the meal or is she covering the whole bill? Yes, Dutch treat. I don't care. Just over tip to make up for her cheapness. Yeah, would you spy on your other person's tip and then like over I, you, I always ask, what, how much are you putting on that thing? Three bucks. Three bucks? Crap. Yeah. All right. You're real wingding. You cheap giraffe. Six more. I'll cover seven. (laughs) Yeah, I will will, will tip more if I assume the person I'm with is cheap and they're not tipping well. Yeah. Being cheap over there, Jim? If you can do it, just just tip some more regardless anyway. So that the cheap tip thing, like, that's a different problem. It's not a default character. Some people are just skin flitting. There ain't nothing you're going to do about it. (laughs) Some people are just skin flitting. That's not a – yeah, that's not a room to – to part company. Like, we're done being friends because you don't like to throw a tip. I mean, they get paid or whatever. I mean, I ain't going to argue with about this. I'll give them eight bucks. You give them three. Whatever. We're going to go. I'm trying to imagine the upbringing of this person that has brought up three issues with this 20-year-long friend that are all basically financially based. It is stealing stuff. It is not tipping enough. And it is shysting musicians. And so I'm wondering if the friend was just brought up in a cheapo life, which is flat out how some people are, and you were brought up some straight up, like, you know, Martha's Vineyard life where everything was in excess and everyone should always get uh, what they're paid. Yeah. Sometimes you just got cheapos in your life. I mean, that's a real that's a real uh, perverse dichotomy you've presented. Of course like, it is. This is your life from the past. What is John Kerry over here <laughs> in his private jet all the time versus it might be okay to ski- steal because you were poor. Like those I, never said, that that you, I never said you're giving a pass on stealing. I'm just saying it's a weird thing that these three things you've brought up after 20 years of friendship, which all technically so far have only you've so, only said you've seen once of each three, and now you're you're in a place where you're I miss my friend, and I'm ready to abandon. I thought your friend died at the beginning of this, but it just turns out you don't like the way they tip. You're sick of them stealing around you, which you've only said you've seen once. And they snuck into a music festival, which we are still not sure about the premise of. Now, hold on. No, hold on. We didn't take box three. Let's say you're going, you go to music events often, and every time Rhoda is trying to hop to fence, sneak underneath the turnstile, put a trench coat over her face, and walk in with Aerosmith. I like, would flat out tell security. You would say, hey. If it's been a multiple time situation where, like, hey, man, we went to this concert last week, and we went to that band place a month and a half ago, and I remember this maybe six months ago. You have snuck into every single one. We're at that festival. I will tell security on you. Yeah. I've told you, hey, stop. Because at that point, I didn't invite you to come to this concert with me, or I'm an idiot. In that situation, you found out that I was going to some kind of musical situation and then went, yeah, buddy, and tried to hop over me I can get to in, get yeah. past it. Nah, uh When you suss security. this out in the parking lot, right. hey, man, I see you. You got tickets Rhonda? Into, into the Doobie Brothers? <laughs> yeah. Show me your ticket right now or we're not it. walking in. I got them. Uh, they're my purse. We'll get them yeah. out of the gate. Nah, we ain't getting them out of no gate. <laughs> right. I don't she, believe you for nothing. When she shows up with her Grand Funk for free t-shirt, you're like... <laughs> I don't think this is going to go <laughs> yeah. how I expected. Why are you wearing that Subo outfit? <laughs> hey, I see your button that says I never pay for band merch. I don't like what you're doing. So, well, I mean, can't you solve? Couldn't you solve this problem less aggressively? Couldn't you just say, Look, "Yes, you're you're allowed, uh, dude. I'll totally go shopping with you. If you steal something, I will make a scene and make sure everyone knows right. you stole it." Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. You can come to this show with you. If I see you try to get in for free, I will totally rat you out. If you still want to come under those terms. <laughs> Go ahead. And if you've been like legitimate friends for 20 years where it, it feels like a passing of a friend when you stop hanging out with them, you are definitely in a place where you can look them in the face and go, I will call the cops if I watch you walk around, walk out of here with anything. Yeah. Right. This is an insult to me as a paying customer. <laughs> yeah, you understand? Right. I pay $45 to get to this festival, and you hopped a gate. You know how, how that negates my $45? I it, it, I should be insulted, not the band, me, right? Because I paid full price to get in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is totally fine. And you're right. Boo was right. If this is that, that close of a friendship, uh, I think you owe it to them not to bail. I think you just stick with it and be really irritating. Yeah, about you got to be a good, re- stop stealing, good person here. Yeah. Wow. 
Okay, the question was, uh, let's see. Should I reach out and suggest we do things that don't involve music, restaurants, or shopping? Maybe we can just go for walks and talk. I miss her friendship. Secular says, I don't advise that. The woman you quotes miss, I hesitate to refer to her as your friend, is selfish, stingy, dishonest, self-centered, and lacks compassion for others. You need her in your life like a moose needs a hat rack. Find walking companions who are caring, generous, and honest with whom to get your steps in. Secular got a bonus for that moose and hat rack comment. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it. There was a $50 like editor's bonus to that statement. Sec- Secular's no been reading Morris the Moose Goes to School with the Ooh. grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a group of farmers at the local gas station getting a chuckle about that comment right now. And that's about as far as it's going to go. Okay, second of all. Get a divorce and get some counseling. I hesitate to refer to you. Self-centered, stingy, Uh. dishonest, selfish. Lacks compassion for others. (coughs) You know, first of all, these these are like... These are humorous crimes to me. (laughs) That's unfortunate. I mean, these are not... These are not like... Like like drug peddling felonies. Yeah, you didn't find out they stabbed their husband fifteen years ago. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, you you put an almond joy in your purse. You hop the gate to Aerosmith, <laughs> and like you feel like you people got to earn their tip, and then you ain't seen it yet, so uh, you got to stick with nothing. <laughs> well, I think I mean, before before you pursue this relationship, make sure they're paying for their Netflix. Uh, you know, make sure that uh, I mean, yeah, these are wheel- they're paying the every penny of the taxes. You know, that the, the never taking a pen from work. Uh, yeah, right, right, right. What are you, what are you not evaluating? Look yeah. at their yeah. W two versus what you know they have, yeah. and you will I mean, never speak to this person again. Yeah, yeah donated three thousand to Goodwill. You did not. I was at Goodwill. You stole stuff from that. <laughs> what, do you know? what do you think those socks are worth? On the ice. Rhonda, I saw Ryan you walk Stone. out with that scarf. I know what you did. You? I was the only one who paid at that register, and you came out with a new hat. I know what happened. I just, I mean, I, I, it sounds like you're, like you're maturing past your friend, and so it's probably time to cut it. But, like, if you really miss their friendship, I don't know. Like, the fact that you have to decide the venue to keep them from committing crimes, it's, I mean, it's ridiculous. She can't have any friends. I mean, all of her friends are going to have flaws. Yeah, so, wait, can you think of a situation of which you said, look, uh, I still like this person, they're my friend, but I'm not going to, I'm will, not willing to go do this thing with them. Any alcoholic friend I have. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you say, yeah. I'm not going to hey, drink Joe, this, this I know thing. you get tanked every time you're around a bottle of anything. So, guess what we're not going to do? We're not going to go to the, I'll yeah. go see a movie with you. But I'm going to sniff your drink. <laughs> Where do you take someone who steals it all the time? You take them to a field. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you Maybe you the take them field. to the middle of a field that has no crops in it because there's a chance they're going to get some corn out of the deal. And they're going to try to sneak in. <laughs> or you walk in, there the, a gate you to walk in the gate and they're hopping the fence. <laughs> yeah. Ethel, there's no pay here. There's no cover. <laughs> I, I just want to be certain. I totally did. I know. Anybody playing a guitar in here? <laughs> yeah, or like an RV dealership. You're like, good luck, D.B. Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't getting out of here for nothing. Let's see if you can if you can steal something from here. I mean, you can get a seat cover out of one of those. I'll pay for it. Oh, I mean, man. that might even be funny. Hey, man, yeah. As my friend, don't ask me to go to a Chinese buffet. I'll appreciate that, but this is ridiculous. Yeah. All right, hey, you've been listening live from the bath. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. We really do appreciate it. If you have anything for us, any feedback, any questions. Any common bits of wisdom? We've not done Secular for Solomon for quite a while, so hopefully we'll hit that up uh, on the next show. But you can hook up with us on the Live from the Path. Bob Eisen on our complaint line. That's 515-517-0085. That's call or text. In fact, do text. Uh, well, you could call. But I, I think, don't think text, you've ever answered a single one of my calls. I think the text. I can tell it's you. Your number shows up. All right, dot point. Um, and your face. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> He's made his, made his uh, a rendering of himself out of ASCII characters. <laughs> like, I know that's Booba. I once drew a turtle with those characters at the bottom of my email signature work. I mean, I got more compliments on that than any work I've legitimately done in the company. Funny enough, I mean, they, they paid me for two hours worth of effort doing that. I'm like spacing stuff around, putting little like uh, parentheses in together so it looked like a turtle. I, I really have to reckon with that statement now. Are you talking about like keyboard yeah. symbols? Yeah. For some reason, I thought you said CSI Miami characters, and I thought like Booba put himself in as Horatio Sands, <laughs> so it made that. Yes, the, the I knew if you saw Horatio, you would think of me. <laughs> what, is that? what is that noise? That's the opening to the Who's. I don't. I don't think the he Who makes song. The noise, though. CSI Miami. 
right. Yeah, that's right. That's right on. <laughs> that's wrong. All right. Anyway, <laughs> the, we're going to cut you loose. Uh, be faithful to means. God will handle the ends. You've been listening to Live from the Past.